graduate students and most of the volunteers, we really appreciate any feedback you give us on any of our talks. So for those of you who fill it out, there'll be cookies up the front and pencils if you forgot to bring your pen. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Matt Russo. Matt works at the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics upstairs in this building, near where the telescopes are actually. And tonight he's here to tell you about Planet Nine from outer space. So let's all give him a welcoming hand. Thank you. You are interested in the unknown, the mysterious. And now for the first time, I'm bringing to you the full story of what happened on that fateful day. <laughs> I'm bringing to you all the evidence based on the testimony of the miserable souls that survived this terrifying ordeal. Before we start the presentation, I have to ask you, can your hearts stand the shocking facts about Planet Nine? Okay. We shall move on then. <laughs> so that's the opening monologue for one of the worst movies ever made <laughs> called Plan 9 from Outer Space. Um, today we're going to be talking about one of the greatest stories ever told, which is discovering planets in our solar system. So we're going to review the history of how that happened and then focus on what you're probably really here to see, which is Planet 9. Is there a new planet in our solar system called Planet 9? So let's start by thinking about how do we discover planets in the solar system. The first tool is our eyeballs. You can see them, you just point. Right? Some of the planets are the brightest objects in the night sky, other than the moon. Specifically Jupiter right now. If you look southeast, or southwest now, some time has passed, the brightest thing you'll see is Jupiter. So our, our ancestors could spot them. And there were five of them that you could see with the naked eye at the time, with average eyes. But the real reason they could tell there was something different, of course, was that unlike all the other points of light in the sky, they moved. Planet means wandering star in Greek. Right? So if you look at Mars and Saturn right there, that's pretty much where they are right now, incidentally, or about a month ago. And if you just look at them at the same spot in the sky, night after night for about a month, you'll see that all the stars stay fixed, except those two bright ones. They're wandering. Okay? Sometimes they even do a weird zigzag called retrograde. So that's what separates planets from stars. The fact that we can see them moving means they're a lot closer than the stars which we can't see moving. So that's how we discovered the first five uh, naked eye planets. Okay? Of course the Earth would be the sixth, but that's kind of obvious. <laughs> what we really care about is what happened next. Right, all right? Ancestors knew these since antiquity. It wasn't until 1781 that we discovered that there were more planets in the solar system. So, super eyeballs, the invention of telescopes. That really helped us out. Here is uh, William Herschel and his sister Caroline. Um, he was a musician and astronomer, like myself. But unlike myself, he built his own telescopes. So he had to build that. You couldn't go to the store and buy that. He built it, and then he kind of just scanned the skies, wrote down what he saw. He compared what he was seeing to maps of stars they already had. He made maps of stars that he could see that other people couldn't see for years. And then one day he was pointing in the right spot in the sky. He saw something very much like that. Okay, so there's a kind of brightish thing. Maybe you can tell it has a bit of a blue tinge to it. And he thought that was interesting, so he just kept looking at it day after day, week after week. And this is what he saw. This little dot was also a wandering star. There's more out there. It opens the door. And so, of course, at first he didn't know what he was looking at. He thought it might be a comet. All you can really tell is it's, if it's moving like that, it's got to be closer than the stars. He thought it might be a comet. Um, but at the time, he really wanted to impress King George III, so he decided to call it George's Star. We now know it's not a comet. It's not a star. It's actually the planet Uranus. Okay. Looks like that. And so his friends eventually convinced him to just call it Uranus after a Greek god, just like all the other planets. Um, the king was still impressed, though. He still <coughs> knighted him, because, of course, <laughs> first guy to discover a planet. So that was 1781. Okay, as soon as they got this discovery, this really changes everything. It doubled the size of the known solar system. And so now we can plot the inner planets here. So Mercury, Venus, Mars, Earth, uh, are all tucked in here. Asteroid belt, 
Jupiter, Saturn, and now we have Uranus, a new planet to play with. About 100 years before this, Newton discovered his famous law of gravity. This is the famous clockwork universe. We can use this very simple equation to tell us where things are going to be in the future. And so we know where Uranus is, we know how it's moving. We know that there's a force of gravity between Uranus and the Sun, that's what keeps it from flying off into space, keeps it in an orbit. But there's also a slight tug from Jupiter, and a slight tug from Saturn, and on and on with every other object. These are the ones that are most important though. So we know the forces on Uranus, that means we can predict the future, where Uranus is going to be in the future. And that's what this computer program is doing right here. It's doing that exact calculation, maybe 10 times a second. It's just saying, where is everything? What are all the forces? What should I do next? Over and over and over again. And it lets us predict that Uranus should go in a pretty circular orbit, but with slight, uh, slight differences to being completely circular. And so scientists did this, not with the simulation, of course, but just with math. And they worked out where Uranus should be, and they just kept watching it. And after about 80 years, Uranus had done a complete orbit. So they had really good data on where it was at all points in its orbit. And they compared it to these predictions, and they didn't agree. Okay, so there's two options. Basically what I'm saying is, they predicted Uranus should be over there. They look with the telescope, it's over there. Something's wrong. So either your equations are wrong. That was definitely a possibility at this time. This is very early on. Or there's just another object out there tugging on Uranus causing the extra discrepancies. Your equation is totally fine. And so, we're now in about the middle of the 19th century, 1846. Le Verrier had this idea, the French Urbain Le Verrier, and he just used math. He calculated, if Uranus isn't where it should be by a certain amount, what kind of planet and where would it be to cause that discrepancy? So if there's an extra planet in the solar system, he was the first guy to figure out how massive it would be, and where it would be. Because no one had found it in their telescopes, right? So he figured that out, did the calculations, that's just one of the sheets. He sent those calculations to astronomers in Berlin and said, look here for my planet on this night. <laughs> Same thing the first astronomers did, basically. But they didn't know what they were looking at. And within an hour, someone had found it. And that was planet Neptune. Planet Neptune was found with the point of Le Verrier's pen. First planet found just with math. And of course, the observationalist. <laughs> Someone has to point the telescope in the right direction. Let's not forget that. Um, so it's a huge achievement, right? And Newton's laws do work. Okay. Turns out they don't always work, but they are working in this case. We can make predictions about where planets will be in the future. Uh, it turns out that at about the same time, there was an Englishman named John Adams who had a very similar idea. And he did very similar calculations and predicted a very similar orbit for where Neptune should be. And for decades following, there was a very bitter rivalry over who actually finished that last squiggle on their sheet first and discovered the planet. It turns out that um, not only did France win today in the World Cup, or in the, the Euro Cup, they also won this dispute. It turns out that Le Verrier beat Adams by about two days. <laughs> um, so, the way this always gets characterized is a huge achievement for math and physics. We predicted where a planet should be, we looked and we found it. There's a bit of luck that went into this that people don't usually talk about. So take a look at these orbits. This is Neptune orbiting the Sun. This is where it was in reality in 1846. This is where Adam said it should be in 1846, and this is where Le Verrier said it should be in 1846. From the Earth's vantage point, Le Verrier was within uh, one degree of Neptune. It was pretty much exactly where he said it was going to be. Adams was a little further off, but close enough. Turns out if they had just waited about 80 years, <laughs> see, think about what's going to happen. Neptune's going on its orbit, so 80 years is about when Neptune's completed half an orbit. Okay? But they've overestimated the orbital size. And a key fact about planetary orbits is that the further you are from the Sun, the slower you move. Right? So if these orbits are bigger, their prediction is that Neptune should be slower than the real Neptune. And in 1928, they would have been, would have been way off. Probably wouldn't have found it. 
if that's the way things played out. Maybe at the time they could have refined their measurements a little and gotten better. We would have found it eventually, but the story is always much more interesting than people think. Okay, so that's a huge triumph. We found Neptune. Now we know what it, how big it actually is, not the prediction. Roughly, we can get its mass. We know roughly, well, now we know very well where it is. We know its orbit. And so we say, does that actually fix the problem? Right? This was hypothesized, hypothesized because Uranus wasn't where it should be. So now we know what Neptune actually is. Let's do the calculations again. We find out that Neptune was not enough. There were still discrepancies in Uranus's orbit. Neptune helped, but it didn't go all the way, which leaves the door completely open for new planets. So a key player in this saga was Percival Lowell. You might recognize his name because he was famous for thinking that there were canals on Mars. He thought he could see them through his telescope. He traced these diagrams. He thought what he was looking at were an ancient irrigation system done by a civilization whose you know, planet was dying. The water was evaporating or whatever. They had to make these canals, which would have been the most amazing discovery of all time. But he also looked at Venus. And if you don't know, Venus is covered in very thick, hazy clouds. You can't possibly see the surface of Venus. And he saw pretty much the same thing. <laughs> and historians now think he might have just been tracing the reflection of his own retina, the veins on his retina. <laughs> right? Just the way the eyepiece was set up, it was very possible. And you can see these diagrams, they're pretty close, right? <laughs> So that was, that was not good. He was very embarrassed, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we're talking about the early 1900s here. He wanted to recover from this massive failure. He was a laughing stock of physics. And so he said, I'm going to be the guy that discovers the next planet. And he called that Planet X. And he thought it would be something like Uranus and Neptune, so relatively massive. Okay? Uranus and Neptune have a mass of about 14 to 17 Earth masses. So they're called gas giants sometimes, really. They're ice giants, but they're big. And he said, there's another one called Planet X. And he did similar calculations and said it should be over here. People looked, and they didn't see it. Um, but he wasn't the only one with this idea. Once again, there's another rivalry over these kinds of calculations. Um, his name was William Pickering. He did a very similar thing and said, I'm going to be the guy that discovers the next planet. And I'm not going to call it X, I'm going to call it O, just because O comes after N in the alphabet. <laughs> and so Lowell, of course, was not happy about that. He said, this planet is very properly designated O, for it is nothing at all. <laughs> but that didn't phase Pickering. He kept going with his calculations. He realized that not even planet O was enough to fix Uranus's orbit. So what did he do next? <laughs> he hypothesized planet P and said, maybe that can fix it. And then he went through the calculations and said, that works, but there's still a little left over. <laughs> so maybe there's a Q. And that didn't quite work. So on and on, R, S, T, all the way to U. And every time he'd make predictions and say, this is where they are in the sky. I'm going to be the next Leverrier. And every single time, people point their telescopes, and there was nothing there. Okay, So this field has a long history of false claims. That's what I'm getting at. Okay. Ever since then, there's been hundreds of people saying they found the next planet. And I'm here to tell you today about the best case that anyone has made so far. So we're about to get to that. <laughs> um, so this was the early 1900s. No one could find planet X. No one could find planet O's <laughs> O through U. Um, Lowell died in 1916. Apparently it just crushed him that they couldn't find this planet. And then in 1930, something interesting happened. <coughs> A young Clyde Tomba, he was only 22 years old, was looking for Planet X. He had the predictions of Lowell, he was looking. He kind of scanned around where it could be, and after a few years, he looked at these two photographic plates, six days apart. There's a dot in one, seems like that dot has moved in those six days. It's the exact same thing, wandering stars. It's just harder to see them. And so he went into his uh, supervisor's office and said, Dr. Slipher, which was his name, I have found your planet X. So it's another huge triumph of math, is what everyone thought. Okay, we now know that what he actually found was Pluto. OK, 
Okay, which is great in itself. Of course, we have this beautiful picture now from last year. Um, but Pluto didn't quite fit the bill. They looked at how bright it was and found out that it's way too dim, as in it's way too small to be Planet X. Planet X needs to be massive to cause the discrepancies in Uranus. So this can't be Planet X. This must be something else. Some other rock is floating out there. Okay, but anyway, if he found the next planet, that maybe that's the next, that's, well, that was the ninth planet at the time. Uh, we all know what happened next. In 2006, <laughs> Pluto was banished from being a planet in the solar system. Uh, people were not happy about this. Uh, how many of you are still upset about this <laughs> right now? <laughs> okay. That's what I thought. So these are, these are annual protests. You can join them. In, they're somewhere in California. My favorite is this woman praying that the <laughs> astronomical union will change their minds. <laughs> okay. It's not working. Um, so I get this question a lot. You know, why did they do it? What's the deal? What's the definition of a planet? So I figure we should go through that really quick before we get to the main topic. So this is what they decided on. The International Astronomical Union in 2006 decided that to be a planet you have to first orbit the Sun. Okay, Pluto does that. You have to be round, which really just means you have enough mass so that gravity can squish you, squish you into a circle. You're big enough so that gravity can just try to compact you in the smallest region possible. And you get a circle, or a sphere, roughly spherical. But then it's number three that was kind of designed <laughs> to eliminate Pluto. And that's that you had to have cleared your neighborhood. So I'll show you what that means in a minute. But basically, Pluto is surrounded by a bunch of other debris. That's going to be very important for this talk. It hasn't, it's not big enough to have ejected everything out of its path, like all the other planets have. Okay? The, re the reason that motivated this was that someone had discovered something very similar to Pluto, and another one, and another one, just a little smaller. And so we didn't want to just run away with a huge number of planets. And they also, it does seem different than the rest of the planets. So we call something like Pluto a dwarf planet. A dwarf planet is something that fulfills these first two criteria, but not the next one. Okay, and it turns out that one of the physicists who proposed Planet Nine <laughs> wrote a book called How I Killed Pluto <laughs> and Why It Had It Coming. He, is, he actually discovered Eries, which is a very a dwarf planet similar to Pluto. He had a hand in its demise, and he's very proud of that fact, calling himself the Pluto Killer on Twitter. <laughs> okay, so that was fun and interesting, but I haven't resolved a problem from a few minutes ago. Right? I said that Uranus's orbit was weird, we needed a big planet to fix it, and all we got was <laughs> the stinking Pluto, which wasn't enough. So, this was a puzzle for a long time. It wasn't actually solved until 1989, when the Voyager probe did a flyby of Neptune. So on its way out of the solar system, it passed really close to Neptune, and when it did that, it measured Neptune's tug very, very precisely, and so it could measure Neptune's mass very, very precisely. And found out that Neptune had lost some weight. <laughs> it was actually 5% less massive than we thought it was originally. 5% okay? doesn't sound like a lot, but that's the mass of Mars <laughs> when you're Uranus. Okay? So that really put the last nail in the coffin of Planet X. There was just no need for it anymore. We don't need an extra planet in the solar system because everything checks out. We can use Newton's equations, we can modify them even with what Einstein taught us. Everything checks out, we understand the planets. No planet X. But that hasn't stopped us from looking for much more subtle clues about other planets that we wouldn't have detected yet. So, before we dig into the details, let's just get some definitions. So, distances in space are of course very, very large. We're not going to use meter sticks, we're going to use 150 million kilometer sticks called AU. And AU is an astronomical unit. It's just the average distance from the Earth to the Sun. That's our standard unit. One AU is on average how close the Sun is to the Earth. <coughs> the next thing we have to know is that not all orbits are circular. In fact, none of them are perfectly circular. They're actually ellipses. So if you take a circle and you squish it and shift it over, you get an ellipse. And that's what's happening here. So here's a circular orbit. We say its ellipticity is zero. And as you increase the ellipticity from zero to one, orbits just get more and more squished and more and more shifted. Okay, so you can see this very elliptical orbit 
goes very far from the sun and then gets very, very close to the sun, even though it has roughly the same size as all the other orbits there. Okay? And so when you have an elliptical orbit, you still want to talk about its size. And so we use something called the semi-major axis. So the major axis is just the distance across the long axis of the, the major axis of the ellipse. Semi-major ax axis is just half of that. Okay? Tells you the size of the orbit. And here we have a very elliptical orbit. So there's a spot in the orbit where a planet or an object is very close to the sun. That's called perihelion. It's the point of closest approach. And the opposite one is called apohelion, where it's furthest from the sun. Okay, just a bit of terminology we're going to use. Everyone clear on that? Okay, I'll explain as we go though. So let's take a look at our solar system. So here's Neptune. That's 30 AU away from the sun. 30 times the distance that Earth is. That's the size of our solar system in terms of the planets. As we zoom out, you can see all the planetary orbits are pretty much circles. Their ellipticity is very, very small. They look like rough circles here, except you'll notice that Pluto here in blue is elliptical. It's not very close to a perfect circle. And as we tilt, you'll see that it's also very inclined. All the other planets orbit in pretty much the same plane. Uh, Pluto sticks out. It's oblique, or it has a, a large tilt. This is what's important for today. Right where Pluto is, is something called the Kuiper Belt. And it's kind of like an asteroid belt, but it's outside of Neptune's orbit. It's, about the, it's, it's as if you took the Earth, crumpled it down into very small bits, and spread it out. Okay? It's not a lot of material there, but there's a lot of chunks of material. Pluto is the biggest Kuiper Belt object. Okay, that's what we mean by it hasn't cleared its orbit. <laughs> okay? Very, very messy. Um, so these are the Kuiper Belt objects. You can just think of them as asteroids. There's a few dwarf planets, but they're just rocks and boulders. And since this is so important for our story, we have to learn something about the structure in the Kuiper Belt. Not all orbits are the same. So here is Neptune's orbit around the Sun, okay, 30 AU. Most things in the Kuiper Belt are in the classical Kuiper Belt, and they're just orbits that are pretty much circles. They're orbiting pretty much just outside of Neptune. That's the bulk of the orbits I showed you on the last slide. Classical Kuiper Belt. Then there's this weird population. You can see their orbits stick out, which means they're very elliptical. You've got all these funky orbits. It's called the scattered disk. I'll tell you why in a second. But notice about these orbits. They're all elliptical, but they all get really, really close to Neptune at one point. Their perihelion is very close to Neptune. They go very far, but all of these orbits graze Neptune's orbit. That's why we call it the scattered disk. Those were scattered by Neptune. So here's a very crude animation. Imagine these are particles, boulders, in the Kuiper Belt. Neptune's going to come along in a second. And it's just going to stir things up. It's going to eat some of the Kuiper Belt objects. It's going to give some a weird kick in a new direction. That's called gravitational scattering. Okay? These are going on circular orbits, roughly. And then Neptune gives them a kick, and one flies way off. Okay, but here's the critical thing. If Neptune gives you a kick, and you fly off in a new direction, you're just on a new orbit. You're on a new elliptical orbit, which means you're going to come back to exactly where you started. You're going to come back to Neptune. If Neptune scatters you, you're going to go way out and come right back to where you were scattered. That's how we know those objects in the scattered disk were placed there by Neptune. That's what happens when you put objects near Neptune. They get scattered into these weird orbits. Okay, so we understand the Kuiper Belt. Except in 2004, so relatively recently, we found this guy, Sedna. It's a dwarf planet. You can see it's circular. It's about half the size of Pluto. And it's on this completely crazy orbit that no one thought could exist. So for one thing, it's enormous. It's got the biggest semi-major axis, the biggest size of the orbit but it doesn't get anywhere close to Neptune. And we're pretty sure it didn't form out there because there just wasn't enough material that far out to form something like Sedna. Something must have put Sedna on this very weird orbit. And it couldn't have been Neptune because it's too far away. And then we waited and we found another one. So it wasn't a fluke. And another one, and another one. 
And so the key thing is all these orbits are huge and they don't get close to Neptune. So what else could be happening? To give you an idea of what's going on, I'll tell you that a pattern emerged when we looked at these. And to understand that, let's go through the different ways an orbit could be tilted. Okay, so imagine this rim of the boat is your very elliptical orbit of a Kuiper belt object. Okay, bring up your hands to mimic this orbit. Just do it. <laughs> okay, very elliptical orbit, and your hands are where, close to where the sun is. Okay, that's perihelion, where your hands are. So there's three ways you can be in a different orbit. Right, right now, let's say you're orbiting with all the planets. They're all in the same plane, counterclockwise. Um, one thing you could do is pitch downwards or upwards. You can also roll left or right. And then you can also yaw, which just means rotating to point in a different direction. Okay? So orbits are some random combination of these three things. That's one way to describe them. So here's what the pattern was. Just two years ago, we had enough of these crazy orbits to start looking at these patterns. And we noticed that the furthest ones all pitched down and rolled right. So all the furthest ones were tilted a little down, rolled a little right by the same amount. Okay, so think of how unlikely that is, right? If I, told, if I closed my eyes and told you all to do a random amount of pitching, rolling, and yawing, and then I picked 12 of you at random, the odds of you all pitching down and rolling right are very, very slim. Okay? So people saw that, and a few scientists, well, many at the time, said, could a planet do that? Could a planet cause this alignment, this organization in what should be a random bunch of orbits? But people couldn't figure out how to make it work. They couldn't figure out what type of planet, what orbit it should be on, exactly how it would do this. Okay? So that was where we were until January 20th of this year. And then this paper came out by Mike Brown, Constantine Batygin. The first thing they did is they eliminated all the orbits that could possibly be influenced by Neptune. So you're just taking that out of the pool and looking at what you have left. And then they picked the six furthest objects. And that's what's shown here, the six furthest Kuiper Belt objects that aren't influenced by Neptune. And you can see not only are they all pitching down, rolling right by a bit, they're all oriented in the same physical direction. They're all yawing at about the same amount. Okay, they all go off to the left side of the solar system. That's even more unlikely. So they did some simulations to test how unlikely this is, and they came up with 1 in 14,000 chance that if we found these first six objects, they would be aligned just like this, or in something similar. So it doesn't seem, well, it's a very small chance, but maybe a planet can do that. And so here's what they did. They used the fourth tool of today, which is called n-body simulations. N just stands for the number of objects in your simulation. I actually showed you one earlier. This is part of what they did. First they figured out what type of planet could do this, how massive roughly, what kind of orbits. And then they set up this simulated Kuiper belt with a bunch of Kuiper belt objects with all of the major planets in here. And then, based on their earlier work, they picked a planet orbit. They picked a mass of a planet, planet nine, it would be the ninth planet. They picked a likely orbit, and then they just let the thing go for four billion years. Okay? Four billion years of computer time. <laughs> Took them probably an hour or so to do this. But they did this for many, many different configurations. And so what they found was this alignment could be explained by a giant planet, something with about the mass of 10 Earths, okay? so a little less massive than Neptune or Uranus. It's in between Earth and Uranus and Neptune if it's on this very elliptical orbit, okay, is the first thing, and importantly, you'll notice it's on the opposite side of all the Kuiper Belt objects. If the orbit swings out to the right, that turns out to be essential to keep all the other ones swinging out to the left. And so they estimate the orbit at about, well, I'll just say it's huge, right? The rest of the solar system is tucked in here in this light. You can't even see it. So the closest Planet 9 could get, if it exists, is 200 times the distance from Earth to the Sun. The furthest is 1,200. So to give you an idea of scale, if Neptune's orbit could fit inside Toronto, the closest Planet 9 would get on one side is Kingston. The closest it would get on the, or the furthest it would get on the other side is Winnipeg. 
Okay, so it's way outside of what we think of as the solar system in terms of planets. Okay, that's a very important point. It's way out there. And since it's so far away from the sun, it must be orbiting very, very slowly because gravity is much weaker there. And so a year on planet nine would be from 10 to 20,000 years, 20,000 Earth years. Okay, so it's just so far, it's just ticking along very, very slowly. So it hasn't been where it is now since the Ice Age. Um, if you want to see the data, I, I pulled up a slide. It's not as hard to understand as it, as it looks. This is just the output of one of those simulations. So the colors are telling you the paths of random objects in the Kuiper Belt. This axis is just the size of their orbits. So objects on small orbits are here. Objects on big orbits are here. And this axis is just the angle around on the sky relative to where planet 9's orbit is, where planet 9 kind of sticks out. And so you can see, if you're close to Neptune, which is at 30 AU, you kind of go around at all different angles. If you looked up and saw a Kuiper Belt object, you'd see them in all directions on the sky, evenly. But since planet 9 is somewhere around here, it has a way of uh, forcing all of these objects into a very narrow range. And notice, they're being forced to be 180 degrees away from where the planet's orbit is. Okay, so this is the, the, what their data looked like, right? They weren't simulating the actual objects we know of. They were simulating a hypothetical population and showing statistically this could work. Okay, that's why you can't just use the Kuiper Belt object's orbits and say Planet 9 is exactly here. It's a more of a statistical inference. Okay, it's not as solid as Le Verrier for that reason. But we've made some progress. Um, so, how many of you have heard of Universe Sandbox? One. <laughs> okay. Great. Two, because I told you. <laughs> um, so, this is a fantastic tool. This is basically, it's set up like a video game, but it's really your own personal n-body simulator. In five minutes, you can learn how to simulate any kind of orbits you want. You can create solar systems, you can destroy solar systems, you can destroy the rings of Saturn, you can collide galaxies. It's very, very easy to use. I'm gonna show you how to use it <laughs> right now. Because this is your tool that you can use. Cost 25 bucks, <laughs> and it's <laughs> very easy to set up. It's actually shocking they can do this in real time. So, I guess I have to, uh, this is gonna be a little tricky. <laughs> okay, this is what it looks like. I actually used it to make one of the animations today. And it comes with this simulation. This is those particular Kuiper Belt objects and the hypothetical Planet 9 orbit. Okay, so this is a simulation. If I press play, it's gonna start ticking around. It's doing the calculations right now. This is not a movie, it's a simulation. Which means you could do anything you want to this and see what happens, and it'll tell you. So you can see them now. I'm, I'm at a speed now of almost 100 years per second. I sped it up like that because otherwise nothing would move, right? So you can see here Planet 9 trudging along. Here are these objects trudging along. And you can see they're, you know, pitching forward, rolling right, pointing in one direction of the sky. So just to give you an idea of why this was so surprising, I'm going to erase Planet 9. I got it. Delete. It's just going to keep running without Planet 9 there. And so this will take a while, so for one thing I'm going to speed up time. I'm going to go to 2,000 years per second. Okay, so it's going to look a little crazy. And then we're just going to sit on it and we'll check back a little later. <laughs> and we'll see what happens. Okay. So I removed Planet 9 and we want to see what happens to those objects. Okay, uh, here is one bonus about the Planet 9 story. Planet 9 explained two things. For one, it explained this crazy alignment. Two, it explained how to get those orbits so far away from Neptune in the first place. So, two things. But when they ran the simulations, they noticed a third thing. They noticed that whenever they got this to work, it also created this new population of Kuiper Belt objects. Ones that are on completely crazy orbits, it's gonna show you in a second, these blue ones. These are perpendicular to all the other planets' orbits. 90 degrees up from where all the other planets are orbiting. 
and they shoot right through the inner solar system. And so they saw this in their, well, um, Batygin is the theorist, he saw this in a simulation. He walked two doors down to Mike Brown's office and said, what's going on here? Mike Brown is an observationalist, observational astronomer. He looked through the catalogs and he found objects like this. So this is a hallmark of good science, right? It, it explains things you already know exist, and then it makes a prediction that you can later test. And so even though it only took two minutes <laughs> to confirm this prediction, it still means something. And since then they found a few more, which they applauded here. Where are they? Oh, they're just, they're just rocks. <laughs> they're, they're just like Kuiper Belt objects, smaller than Pluto, smaller than Sedna, big asteroids. <coughs> and so, Batygin said, it's like killing two birds with one stone and not even realizing there was a third in the tree and killing it too. <laughs> <laughs> and it also kind of looks like a pretty bird when <laughs> you yeah, put it all together. A dead bird, I guess. <laughs> okay, we now know what Planet Nine is, hypothetically. We can talk about what it is not. So there was another hypothesized planet called Tyche, which would be a very massive planet, more massive than Jupiter out in the outer solar systems. It's a reasonable idea, thought of to explain something weird going on with comets. But it turns out that we've done a very good survey now of the entire space around the solar system, and we can very confidently rule this out. We would have seen it if it was something this big existed anywhere near the solar system. So Tyche doesn't exist. Another idea was Nemesis, as in the sun has an evil twin, a, a much dimmer, redder star that we orbit on a crazy long orbit, and we just haven't seen it because it's so dim, but for the same reason, we now know that that has also been ruled out. Not possible. Okay. If you go home and Google Planet Nine, most of your page is going to be full of stuff like this. <laughs> so, this is another idea for a possible planet. Um, it turns out the person who thought of this um, was fed that information by aliens who were warning her. Um, so, I mean, it's... For one thing, there's no evidence for it, so it's very easy to rule out. Um, but I shouldn't <laughs> talk about that. Um, the real reason, though, is very simple. If this orbit gets anywhere close to the inner solar system like this, it would be very unstable. As in, it would have destroyed us a long time ago. <laughs> Nothing like this could possibly exist for thousands and millions and billions of years. Okay? So, if Nibiru was going to destroy us, it's just that it's, it's too good at destroying us. It would have happened a long time ago. So, astronomers do not think this exists. Okay? I'm serious though. If you look up Planet Nine, people will just throw in Nibiru as if they're talking about Planet Nine and vice versa. It's a lot of confusion. And while I was looking this up on Google, I came across a bunch of startling headlines. <laughs> New planet discovered in January could end life on Earth scientist claims. <laughs> or, mysterious planet wiped out life on Earth once and could do it again this month. <laughs> or, the New York Post, newly discovered planet could destroy Earth any day now. <laughs> You'll notice this is April 6th, so we're okay. Um, there's actually two things wrong with all these headlines. Has anyone spotted it? It's not discovered. <laughs> okay. It's hypothesized, there's very good evidence, but until we see it, we can't say it's discovered. Okay? The, the people who wrote the paper are the first to tell you that. You should be very skeptical until we can see it. Um, but of course, right after this, there was a bunch of reputable sources writing, no, Planet Nine is not about to wipe out life on Earth. No, Planet Nine won't kill us all. <laughs> and stop blaming everything on Planet Nine. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite, though, is Mike Brown, the, one of the co-authors of the paper, tweeting, It's Saturday. We're one day closer to the day when Planet Nine will have absolutely no discernible effect on the Earth. Okay, that's always. <laughs> so, the reason you can sit comfortable is just that Planet Nine is incredibly far away. It's very, very distant. If you're worried about Planet Nine, you should be very worried about Neptune, which is much closer and more massive than Planet Nine. Okay, so we're completely safe. Um, but Planet Nine brings up a mystery. Why wasn't it invited to the party? As in, everything's happening in the solar system. Things are changing, people are having a good time. Planet Nine is way out by itself. 
That's actually a mystery, right? We use Planet 9 to explain a really far out orbit, and now we have a planet on a very far out orbit. <laughs> so we have to explain that. And so one idea is that maybe it was in the inner solar system, <laughs> but it was on a crazy orbit, it ruffled Jupiter's feathers, and Jupiter sent it off into the distance. So that's called ejection. Maybe Planet 9 was ejected from the inner solar system, just like the Kuiper Belt objects were. Except, most of the time you kick out your drunk friend from a party, they don't come back, right? <laughs> That's true in this case too. Most of the time, the planet will just be, if it has enough force to be ejected, it's just gonna keep going forever. 2% of the time, it'll stay on a very crazy orbit like this, okay? So it's unlikely, but it's possible. Except we have another problem now. If Jupiter kicks it onto this elliptical orbit, like I said before, it's gotta come right back to Jupiter. And it's not, right? It's still, it's very far from Jupiter. So we need something to bring it away. And the key idea is that early in the solar system's formation, the sun wasn't alone. It was born in a cluster of 1,000 to 10,000 other solar systems forming at the same time. And so there's a much greater chance that one of those stars would come really close to our system. And if that happens, um, over time, enough of those collisions can slowly circularize the orbit. They can bring Planet 9 away from the inner solar system. So it's still elliptical, but it's not messing around with the real planets. There's another problem though is that it's also more likely that if a star gets this close, it's going to eject Planet 9 entirely. Okay, so this is a very big mystery. None of these are very plausible, <laughs> well, or likely. But it only takes one, of course, which is the problem we always run into with solar system probabilities. It only has to happen once. And the last idea for how it got there is maybe it was stolen. So these solar systems form in clusters. Maybe Planet 9 was an exoplanet. It was orbiting another star, which happened to get really close to our system. And that's how we captured it on this very big orbit. Okay. This is also unlikely because Planet 9 would have already had to be on a pretty big orbit to be ripped <laughs> from its star so easily. So this is even less than a 1% chance this could have happened, but still possible. Okay, and of course, IFLS can't help themselves. <laughs> a stolen exoplanet that will kill us all? Here's what we do know about Planet 9. Okay. Um, oh, so this is an important thing. When you get home and download Universe Sandbox, you can try this yourself. It comes with a solar system already there. You can make your own solar system, and then you can launch it at whatever speed, whatever angle you want, at our solar system and see how often Planet 9 gets captured. Okay? There's a tutorial on how to do something very similar. It's very easy to have an enormous amount of fun with n-body simulations. Okay. Oh, that was supposed to be an animation, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> so what's inside Planet 9? Um, if it is actually about 10 Earth masses, it's something in between Earth and Neptune. And so if we cracked it open, it might look something like that. <laughs> Uh, really like this. So someone actually studied this. So what would it look like inside? And it turns out it'd be pretty similar to Neptune and Uranus. So rocky core, a lot of water and ices, like methane and ammonia, gas envelope, about three to four times the size of Earth. But the cool thing is, it's very, very far away. The sun's light is doing almost nothing for this planet. It's cooled down to 47 degrees above absolute zero, so negative 225 Celsius. And that's just its own heating. It's still cooling off from when it formed. The sun's rays are not helping it at all. It would be much colder if it wasn't uh, leftover heat. Okay, and of course what we want to do is find this thing, if it exists. So here is the most important thing. What should we do next? These are the familiar constellations. Okay. All, the sun and the planets all track this path pretty closely. Um, you can see the background Milky Way. Okay, it's got a weird shape just because we took a spherical sky and stretched it into a rectangle. But if you plot the possible Planet 9 orbits, you get something like this. Okay. Remember, Planet 9's got a weird orbit. It's tilted very high. That's why it doesn't follow where the other planets are. And here's the spot in its orbit where it's closest to the Earth, your perihelion. Here's the part where it's furthest from the Earth. So what the researchers did is look at past surveys and said, 
out of all the surveys that have been done, can we rule out any of this space so we can narrow down our search? And it turns out there are surveys that have ruled out that patch, survey that's ruled out that patch. Turns out that the Cassini probe, which is orbiting Saturn, is taking very detailed measurements of Saturn. That helps us rule out another patch where Planet 9 can't be, or else it would have screwed up Saturn's orbit. Another mission ruled out that area. Same one could rule out that area. They're working on this area. And so we're left with this relatively tiny patch in the sky where we should be looking. Unfortunately, that's at the spot where Planet 9 is furthest from us. So it's going to be the hardest to detect because it's very, very dim. It's also moving very, very slow because it's very, very far from the sun. And to make matters worse, it's right over top of the background Milky Way. So you're trying to pick out a tiny little dot <laughs> among millions and millions of brighter dots in the background. Very, very hard, but it's possible. So these researchers, along with the two physicists who first proposed an idea similar to this, have started working with the Subaru telescope in Hawaii. And Subaru is going to scan that entire region near Apohelion, the entire region not ruled out by all the other missions. And they figure they can scan this region in five years. They started it in December. So what I'm telling you is we're going to know if there is or isn't a Planet 9 in five years. Um, and if we do discover a new planet, of course, it's going to need a name. We have all these names named after Greek gods. So <laughs> do we have any suggestions for what we should call this thing? <laughs> okay. Anything else? Neptune Jr. Neptune Jr. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Octal. What's that? Pluto backwards. Pluto backwards, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, turns out the researchers have been calling it fatty this whole time. <laughs> Although, if, they'd, if they had their choice, they'd call it George. George, um, My favorite is actually, well, actually, Bowie was suggested because he happened to die the week before this paper came out. Ed Wood. Ed Wood would be good. <laughs> um, I liked Pluto too, <laughs> to differentiate it. Um, Erebus is actually, it's not a very nice name, but it's actually the most likely. Erebus is a, the Greek god of darkness, and Planet Nine is a very, very cold and dark place. So, that would, that'd be my bet. Okay, so let's just return to our simulation before we wrap up. Ah, look what we have. This is a million and a half years in the future, and you can see the orbits are no longer pointing in the same direction in the sky. You can see they're tilted in random directions. Some are pitching left, some are tilted upwards. So they're randomized, right? That's why we need Planet Nine. Because if you just left them to their own devices over a million years, they wouldn't be aligned anymore. That's the whole idea behind Planet Nine. Okay. And if I had a bit more time, I would create a little black hole and fire at the solar system and destroy everything. You can, <laughs> you can do stuff like that. <laughs> okay, takes a bit of time though. Okay, so just to wrap up. Okay. I'll finish with a Carl Sagan quote. Somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. So it may be Planet Nine, in which case there's a ton more mysteries we get to solve. That would be great. And it may not be. But in that case, we still have this huge mystery about the alignment of the Kuiper Belt objects that we get to solve. So either way, it's fun for us physicists. There's always something to do. And I just encourage you to stay tuned because it's a developing story. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions for Matt. Hi. Hi. Um, I can see that you know the math calculations is the way to to discover like how Neptune was discovered. Yep. Now we have this uh, Kuiper belt filled with small masses. Mm -hmm. Was this factored then? That's, it's very hard to factor in um, all these little things. Yeah, so he's asking if we had to factor in all those small Kuiper belt objects into these calculations. It turns out, although the planets can influence the Kuiper belt objects, they're mostly too small to affect each other. So you could do that, you get a very similar calculation. It would just take a lot longer because there's more calculations, um, but it wouldn't affect their results. All these math, like this 
Well, it's only an earth mass, but it's, it's spread out into very many small chunks. So it's an easy, you could run it again and include all that effects. It would just take a few more days. It's possible though. Hi. How far away do they think it is? How far away do they think it is? So I gave you the number in astronomical units. So on average, about 700 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun, which is something like 100 billion kilometers. So it's out there. Um, so how, if they do find it, how will they, who decide, how will they decide who gets to name it? The mathematicians who predicted it? Yeah. How do they decide who gets to name it? So the International Astronomical, Astronomical Union, the same one that demoted Pluto, they were, they were only formed in 1916, so they never had to name a planet, but they would be in charge of naming a planet. And so hopefully, I mean, if, if they put it up to a vote, we're probably going to get some ridiculous ideas, like voting with vote face, do you remember that? <laughs> okay. So they'll decide. <laughs> They can follow the, the, the Greek names, not the codes. They probably will, as a matter of tradition. Yeah, that's most likely, I'd say. Yeah. I guess how does the, one of the things um, Kev region that people have talked about is the Oort cloud. Oort cloud. How would that fit into this? Okay, the Oort cloud is beyond the Kuiper belt. It's actually much further, and it's just a big diffuse cloud of mostly smaller objects, and that's where a lot of our comets come from. And so that's still outside the orbit of Planet Nine. None of those, yeah, so, planet 9 might, might cross the orbits of some of those objects, but they're still too small, and there's too few of them to affect planet 9. I mean, I mean would that somehow stir things up? And well, that was one of the ideas, that planet 9 could help stir things up to cause comets to come into the Earth, but there's just no evidence for that. No evidence. Right? If we look at the record of comets hitting Earth, it's a little controversial, but there's no regular pattern. No one's been able to find a regular pattern which is what you'd expect if a planet knocked comets out every time it went through. So I guess the Planet 9 thing would solve some issues but create others, so it's kind of still... Yeah, well it's already created some others. How does Planet 9 get there? That's always the way science works. Thank you. Uh, questions? More? You got some back? Oh, hi. Um, so we talked about how when we ran the simulation, after a million years, we saw those objects not being in orbit anymore. But those million years haven't passed yet, so we said that Let's say there's a small and huge chance that Planet 9 has been attracted by a gravitational pull of another planet of a different solar system and is now part of a different solar system. We can tell that those objects that were in path and were in place because of Planet 9, mm -hmm. we won't know that their orbits have changed for another million years, correct? Uh, that's true. But so it, it how, takes... Yeah, so how do we measure... Like, is, is there a way to measure... Like, what I'm trying to ask is, can we measure that orbit space of those other objects, whether they are in orbit or not, or like, how would it work? Um, so, first of all, it's very unlikely that if Planet 9 was around long enough to do that, that it's been ejected, because we haven't had any close encounters in the last million years. Okay? We actually know that for a fact. There haven't been any stars that could have stolen or ejected Planet 9 in the last million years. So that tells us right away. We've, if it was there until a million years ago, it'd still be aligned today because of Planet Nine. Yeah. Could I say the percentage chances of formation? Yeah. Um, so those are determined partially by other simulations, <laughs> where they simulate the early cluster with reasonable parameters, and they see how often does a star actually get close enough to do that. So. It, it's a lot of work to do those numbers, but as soon as this paper came out, there, a few months later, there was a flood of people studying this hypothesis. And one of them was a paper that just ran all kinds of possibilities and said, how could it have gotten there? Last okay, last question. Hi. Assuming we do actually find it, do we have much hope of being able to kind of discern very much about its you know, composition or really kind of be able to see much about it? Or really yeah, what could we tell about it if we found it? Well, first of all, we can study the light that it does emit. That'll tell us its temperature, and we can probably tell the elements in its upper atmosphere. That's a huge first clue. We want to know, does it have the same elements as Neptune and Uranus? In which case, it probably formed close to them. Does it have something completely different? Is it somehow an enormous rocky world or something we haven't seen before? We could figure those kind of questions out very easily once we find it.
Hey everyone, before we wrap up, I have a few announcements for you. Those of you who signed up for planetarium shows will be meeting your planetarium ambassadors who are back there waving at you right now in front of the elevators that are just across the stairwell. So you leave this room, you keep walking in a straight line to the elevators. Those of you visiting the telescopes will want to do the same as you take the elevators all the way up to the 14th floor and follow the signs. I think we're going to have some interesting things for you to look at tonight. <coughs> and we're trying something new. Normally you have to register for planetarium shows in advance. But this week we have two shows that will be first come, first serve. We have Lisa here. She has tickets for the last two shows of the night. You can meet her in front of the elevators where you'll go to the telescopes. And she will be handing out tickets first come, first serve. With that all said, I'd like to remind you to keep your feedback forms and fill them out before you leave for cookies at the front with pencils here if you need them. Let's thank Matt again for a great time. Thank you.